Welcome uh, to our ISIS meeting. This is our main quarterly meeting. Um, I'm Dustin Telford. I'm the current president of ISIS. I'd like to first uh, talk about a couple of business issues before going right into the, the presentation. Um, ISIS membership is free for some folks that didn't know that. That's an important um, thing that the uh, board has decided to do this year. And we will review it in the fall. So if you want to see that to continue, I would uh, strongly encourage you to get more people in the seats. I think that's that's one way we drive that. Uh, because then we can promote to our, our sponsors how, how many people attend our meetings. <clears throat> this will be our first meeting where we will be webcasting. So we'll have some folks from uh, Florida, from Colorado, uh, from Idaho, of course. Uh, and several other places across the country. Uh, Pat Lynch, who some of you have met at one of our previous meetings, or a couple of our previous meetings, will also be in attendance from wherever in the world he is this week. He travels a lot. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's the general ISIS business that I want to bring up. Now, there, is, uh, there will be some things coming out through our website. So if you are not a member, you should be a member. <laughs> because we will be disseminating a press release probably tomorrow, and maybe on Monday when it's released, from Amy, regarding a conference that went on, or a summit that went on last week. Uh, during that summit, 30 of us, including myself, were in a room and discussed a, a future that we'd like to have for our profession. And part of that future includes trying to define or come up with a common name for our profession. Maybe not for our professionals at this point, so uh, some of us may be called biomed, some of us may be called clinical engineering, uh, technician or manager, or medical equipment repair, as we brought up to me earlier. But for the profession, there will be a proposed name, and I bring this up because it's a proposed name, and it's important to me and to everybody that was on this, on this uh, body that there will be a comment period so that you can go in and you can say, and pick it apart and say, well, I, I like it because of this, or I don't like it because of this, so that we can really get some feedback from the entire industry, if you will, that services, maintains, supports in some way, uh, capital, medical equipment, in a healthcare uh, setting. So look for that. If you aren't an ISIS member, or you're not subscribing at least to our newsletters uh, or announcements, go out to www.isis-biomed.org and subscribe to it. I assure you it will go out as soon as I see it. Um, and it will also go out through other channels. So if you're a member of some other association, you'll probably see it blasted out every which way. So you might get duplicate messages if you want. Uh, tonight it's our pleasure to hear from who I personally think is one of the leaders in the industry uh, as far as especially as far as the topic from which we will hear tonight. Uh, ben Seng Wang, uh, I'm going to mention a few of his credentials, is the Vice President of Performance Management and Regular, Regulatory Compliance for Aramark Healthcare's Clinical Technology Services. He oversees the nationwide medical equipment management program that establishes the operating policies and procedures for equipment planning, acquisition, maintenance, retirement, replacement, supplier management, regulatory compliance, risk control, and quality monitoring and improvement. So if you think your day was busy today, <clears throat> this gentleman has an equally busy day, I'm sure, um, handling all this. <clears throat> this covers 522 clients. There was a recent acquisition <clears throat> that also included probably a few more clients than our bio reflects. Is that probably accurate? <clears throat> of uh, Master Plan, who some of you may be familiar with. And uh, he's got the general responsibility for compliance with medical equipment laws, regulations, and standards. And if we have to deal with maybe one or two states in our normal business, think about uh, what he has to deal with. Uh, it's a hodgepodge, I'll tell you folks, uh, of who's out there and, and what they require, say, in radiology or, or general biomed services. 
Um, uh, Mr. Wang is also a fellow of the American College of Clinical Engineering, a certified clinical engineer, uh, and a fellow of the American Institute of Medical Equipment or Medical and Biological Engineering, a senior member of the uh, American Society of Quality. He's also uh, certified as a quality systems uh, auditor at the ISO 9001. And these are just a list of some of his credentials. One of the awards that he's received recently, excuse me, one of the awards that he's received recently was from uh, uh, Amy last year for the Biomedical Clinical uh, Engineering Achievement Award, uh, which is one of the top recognitions for any clinical engineer could ever receive. Without much more delay, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Ben St. Wang, to talk about evidence-based maintenance. Thank you, Dustin, for such a kind introduction that uh, I think only my mother can <laughs> use the rest of it. I better than that. Um, I prefer to be rather informal and really have a conversation with you folks, uh, even the folks who are listening in from uh, other sides. Uh, I hope they can uh, call in for questions or texting or whatever is the case, because I think the benefit of such a conversation really in exchanging ideas rather than just talk you guys to death here. Otherwise, just Turn down the lights, right? Keep the lights in. in the <coughs> so, let's uh, see a few things uh, that I think help us start the conversation, and then uh, please feel free to interrupt. And at the end, we will also give you plenty of time to uh, ask questions, etc. So, let's start with the famous question. Uh, if Dustin said that we have a hard time finding out the name of the profession, by the way, my favorite name to the best of my understanding that was proposed is the TGIB, uh, the guys in the basement. <laughs> 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 or, or the guys in the closet. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so preventive maintenance or my now colleague, uh, Dr. Malcolm Ridge, will prefer to call preventative maintenance, being, being British, mm -hmm. right? Uh, predictive maintenance, plan maintenance, or proactive maintenance, right? This word is particularly good. I like this <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, many of you know <laughs> it the moment, you know? So, I said, well, if he can use that, I can probably adapt that to this, right? The problem is that I wrote this thing before they killed Bin Laden. So now I have to properly track this thing here. Right? So, okay. So, censor, forget it. You never heard this. I never said it. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. So, whatever term or whatever definition you have for PM, let's see uh, how you currently decide on doing it. Uh, a lot of people say OEM said to do it. And the Joint Commission said to do it, 100% uh, for life support and that's for non-life support. Uh, a lot of states have licensing codes or they follow the verbatim CMS rules that require 100% PM on everything or at least per OEM recommendation. Uh, I'm not sure about your state, uh, Utah. Uh, we don't have any crimes here, to the best of my knowledge, my state does not either. But I heard that Idaho has a, uh, a state licensing code that is uh, requiring everybody to follow OEM recommendation. Although whether it's enforced or not, I, I don't know. Okay. And uh, I've heard this argument many times that uh, you cannot uh, forego uh, any PM because if you do that, uh, you are going to put patients at jeopardy and your lawyers or your risk department will never allow you to do that. Uh, but this is the one that I think most people respond to from all the different places that they say that's the way we've been doing it. So 
I scratched my head for quite some time and decided to find a story that I can tell you to really hopefully make you understand what's the importance of tradition. And this story is about our good friend Dustin. Uh, I had to call quite a few people who know him uh, well over the years because I don't personally know him well enough. So, Dustin, I apologize if your friend sold you out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Not my fault. My understanding is Dustin is not the, obviously old, I'm much older than him, but he is well known, well experienced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he has quite a few years of experience under his belt too. Uh, but when he was a young person, just out of school, very ambitious, trying to, you know, climb the corporate ladder and all that. He had a episode that was really remarkable. He just got married, and he said to his wife, "said Hey, darling, we really need to invite my boss and my boss boss and their respective spouses to come to dinner because I want to introduce you. I want them to know me better. I want them to know that we are a." really good family, good people, etc., etc. So they will give me more opportunities for growth. And to do that, I really want you to cook that roast beef that I always enjoy at your parents' home. Your mother cook it. such a delicious roast beef that we impress the folks very much. He's proved right at that time. said, well, okay, uh, I definitely want to help you. However, there's a little problem. I'm not like, such a good cook, and my mom is the one who always did the roast beef. I never did it myself, so how are we going to put this off? He said, you know, no problem. Just call mom and get the recipe, right? And I will go to the butcher and buy the best cut of roast beef I can get. And we'll get this done. So he made the invitation, set it on the date, got everything ready and said, OK, I'm going to the butcher. So, Mr. Butcher, what's the price for the best roast beef I can buy? The guy said, well, how many people you have for dinner? I need to know that. The guy said, well, as he said, two, 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 six people, right? Three couples? OK, the guy said, mm, OK. How many have the person that spins nine pounds? Because when you cook, the thing shrinks, right? So you have to make an allowances. We don't want to be stingy on your dinner, important thing. Okay, here's the box. It does itself. Whoa! <laughs> hey, remember, I'm just a young professional. This is a lot of money here. Uh, you guys are, well, you know, we can cut a few corners here and there, but this is going to be difficult. He said, okay, at least get six pounds if as a bare minimum, because less than that you're going to have a real, you know, not very pleasant, you know, if things run short. So, okay, let's do it. Put down, what, a quarter of his monthly payment there, monthly salary, and then went home and said, honey, here is the recipe. Got the recipe? Yes, got the recipe. Okay, so, do you need some help? What can I do for you? So get that big butcher knife for me, put this roast beef here, and let's cut an inch from each side of the roast beef. So I said, wait, 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 wait. I just talked the butcher into giving me the bare minimum. You now want me to cut one inch from each side, that means we're not going to have enough. But the wife said, well, Sorry, honey, I called my mom, I got the recipe that is exactly what the recipe calls for. So, no choice. Go ahead and do it. Must they be a very scientifically trained, technical, you can't put that person's a nerd. Got to be a reason for this. Call mom and ask to explain why. And tell her that we just got the bare minimum, we cannot do this without a good reason. Can we cut maybe half an inch on the side? Can we do a quarter inch? Can we do something? Okay. 
for a called mom, not mom said, one inch from side. Oh, and by the way, that's not my recipe, that's your grandma's recipe. And that's the way the grandma did it. And it always came out right. Okay? And that's how your father always liked. So don't skip on this. Go ahead, cut. This is not rational. This is just because he did it, I need to understand why. Okay. So the poor wife pick up the phone and call the grandma. Now grandma, poor grandma is in the nursing home, right? You wake up the grandma in the nursing home. Oh yeah, darling, why are you calling me? Yeah. I need, oh, you need the recipe. Yeah, I gave your mom the recipe. Yeah, but mom, can I explain why we need to put the grandma in the nursing home? the roast beef one inch from each side. And my husband said that we are not going to have enough meat for dinner. The grandma said, oh, yeah, let me think about it. You always did it. Yeah, let me think about it. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Your grandfather was not a very rich person. We had a little house. We had a little kitchen. Everything there was small. And the oven was not very big. So, Beef at that time was not expensive, so we all bought a large chunk of beef. But then, in order to fit into the oven to roast, we had to cut it. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> and the dinner went marvelous. Well, that's where you are today, a well known leader in King Engineering, right? <laughs> so much for your addition. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's get back to serious business. Good news. As you guys know, the Drink Commission did not change anything significant from 2010 to 2011. However, actually even better, some of you may have seen actually a soapbox article that I published on the 24 by 7 magazine, alerting folks that in spite of the traditional, let's say, difference in interpretation between CMS and the Joint Commission, the issue of following or not OEM recommendation has been finally resolved. Namely, the Joint Commission, as you folks know, have always, for 20 some years, uh, recommended the FEMICO and Smith model of using risk classification to plan for maintenance. Whereas the CMS have for all these years written, not in law, but in so-called interpretive guidelines that is offered to the state inspectors to inspect hospitals, the rule that you shall perform maintenance according to OEM recommendation. The two are obviously very different. So since 2009, the Judicial Commission was required by a new law of Congress to apply it to CMS for permission to accredit the hospitals. Previously, the Judicial Commission had that privilege given directly by the Congress, not by the Department of Health and Human Services. So the Judicial Commission had to explain why they do something different to the CMS, and CMS fortunately accepted the Joint Commission explanation, thanks to a lot of work that George Mills and his colleagues did to explain that. Okay, so this is even better news. Otherwise, we will all be forced, maybe with the exception of the folks in Idaho and some other states like Indiana and um, in Louisiana, if I remember correctly, has exactly the same rule as CMS. So that's great. But there is a little detail here that we need to talk about. When CMS and the Joint Commission agreed that it's not necessary to follow exactly OEM recommendation, they both said, okay, how do we know that somebody by deviating for OEM recommendation, they're not shortchanging the patient safety? They're, cutting, they're not cutting cords, in other words. It's a very legitimate question. Okay. Obviously, some people may say, well, OEM recommendation is just a recommendation. True. And 
Very often, OEMs don't have concrete proof that what they recommend is necessary. But since they are the ones who design and manufacture the equipment, you presume that they know a little better, right? And their maintenance documentation is part of what they submit to the FDA for the approval of the device to be sold in the United States. So until proven to the contrary, that has to be, if not the best word, at least one of the most, let's say, well considered rules or recommendations of how you should do things. So if you say, I don't like it, and I'm going to do it different, you better have a justification for it, right? It's like, for example, you go to the doctor and say, I have a headache, I have this, I have that. The doctor says, okay, let me examine you, let me do a battery test, the images, whatever you, and say, you need to take, take this medication. The doctor, when gives you a prescription, they take into the consideration the drug manufacturer's recommendation. If you have a patient with this weight, this kind of condition, you should give this person three doses per day of this uh, concentration, etc., etc. Now, the doctor has the privilege to deviate as part of being a licensed practitioner. And, but they know also that they that have a reason to deviate because they can be sued and how liable if whatever they give to the patient is not the right thing. Now, we are not exactly a doctor, but we are like a doctor in the sense that we treat, not patients, but we treat something called medical equipment. And we have to take care of the medical equipment just like a doctor take care of a patient. And there are certain recommendations that the manufacturer said you should do. And if you say, okay, I don't want to do it, I want to do something different, you better be able to explain why you're doing different and prove that you're not cutting corner, not damaging the equipment, which by turn can damage, cause a problem to a patient. So that's the bottom line here that we're talking about. What is the effectiveness of your maintenance strategy? You may say, I do this every year instead of six months. The manufacturer says six months, I do every year. The manufacturer say, I recommend you do every three months. You say, no, I want to do every six months. Okay, but prove it to me that you are not going to create a problem. Okay, are we agreeable here? Okay, so let's see how we're going to cover this thing today. So the important question is, how do you convince surveyors that your maintenance program is effective? The evidence-based maintenance has four steps, which is basically the old Pen to Check Act. Some people um, would prefer to call it the Pen to Check Act, but uh, Pen to Test Act. That's fine. And then we are going to discuss about the lessons we have learned, what uh, we have concluded so far. Okay. All right. This first part here, I'm not going to spend that much time here because we all know they have a lot of discussion, a lot of things written about how to perform the so-called risk-based analysis. Since Dr. Fenico and Smith proposed this idea, it was published by the Joint Commission, a lot of changes have been made, actually made changes, some other people made changes, etc. And I think the bottom line here is you do whatever you prefer, you want to do. I really don't care how you do it, as long as you can prove it to me that you're doing the right thing. If you have a magic wand, you blast the equipment, the equipment will be perfectly safe and working well, it's fine. Right? So, we are going to concentrate the discussion here, because this is what is really the core question here that we have had some difficulty in really proving to people. Some people may come and say, I do PM and I don't find any single failure during my PM and therefore I'm doing the right thing. Would you guys agree with that? Zero defect PMs. Is that the right measure? 
is part of the right measure. It may not be the total right measure, but it's only part. So if, let's say you do 100 PM, one fails, and then you mean, that means your PM program is bad? No. Okay, two, nope. three, four, five, six, seven. Now you're beginning to get a little bit more something, something's going on with your PM system. But, what's the cutoff? What's the cutoff? I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. You cannot tell the surveyor, I don't know. Right? <laughs> well, I'll find out. Good <laughs> 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 answer. Good <laughs> answer. Until then, your hospital is suspended. Your license is suspended. Because a doctor, practitioner, is licensed by the state as well. If the doctor asks the question, say, I don't know, I will find out, the board of licensing of the state will say, Dr. So and so, you are therefore suspended until you find out how to do the right thing. Because we don't want you to find out, play with our patients anymore. Right? So, let's think about this. Okay. Before I forget, I want to acknowledge a lot of people that have uh, participated in this project. Uh, this is actually the, only the tip of iceberg. We have done this project for now a little over three years, and these are the managers of the accounts who have supported us. This is about 20 some accounts. And under <coughs> these managers, we have obviously a large group of farmers, about, about roughly 250 people who participated in this project. So this is not my work, this is the work of a large group of people. It's not the entire hour, we have about uh, 1,200 people, so this is a small group, but as you will see why we decided to work with a small group and not the entire group. Okay? Uh, there are some earliest work, work that were presented. I'm not going to read you. You have the slides. This is a book that um, one of our good friends, who that's Adler's published. And we have three uh, articles so far published. Uh, two last year and one this year about uh, the results I'm sharing with you. Okay, so let's let's uh, address this issue, right? Go back. You say to the survey, I adopt risk-based inclusion criteria, therefore my program should be perfect. Is that an acceptable answer? The second answer is, I perform PM and I do PM completion exactly as the commission recommend. 100% for life support and whatever. In theory, I am not missing three out of all the PMs that are scheduled, I never miss two. Or I have a very fast repair turnaround time. So my clinicians, users really rarely run out of equipment to use. Or I have a very small amount of repeat work orders, meaning my repairs are done properly and so that there are no repeats. So let's see by a raise of hands. Who prefer the first one? You can choose only one of the four. So how many would prefer the first one? Okay, one. Second one. One. Hey, hey. Okay. Feel more, okay. Yeah. Fast at a rock time. No. Repeat the work orders. <laughs> hey, there are a lot of people who are not voting here. <laughs> okay, so let's let's examine the weaknesses of this is one more actually achieved. If I PMs, this is one we discuss a little bit. A lot of people think this is the the, the right answer. Okay. Have you heard of this thing? Good intentions do not guarantee good results. Mm -hmm. okay. Or some people say that uh, a battle plane, it's a good battle plane until the first shot is heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, <coughs> pain is not outcome. We need to see the outcome. Okay. PM completion. <coughs> we actually, as we discussed uh, before, uh, PM is not really 
preventive maintenance in many cases. A lot of times we are really finding failures that have already occurred. The most famous, famous one is our good old friend called lateral safety. Are you preventing anything when you do a lateral safety check? No. no. You're finding something that has already happened, right? It's leaking too much or it's lack of uh, too high ground resistance. Something already happened. So this is really not preventing. You are detecting something that already happened and you're trying to fix it. Okay. All right. Fast repair turnaround time. Well, it depends. Right? People say, I need to repair ventilators quickly because that's life support. Yeah, but ventilators very often you have a backup ventilator. But if you have two CTs in your hospital, one CT is taken down for real PM. Full scale here, several hours down. The second CT is the only one CT there for operating. You have a trauma patient brought into the ER. You slide that patient into the CT because I don't know of any neurosurgeon who would open the skull and look into the brain without having a CT first. Right? So, put the patient in there. You start scanning and then the CT stops. What do you do now? This is a real case, happened not that far from here, neighboring state. The neurosurgeon said, I'm not going to open this one, transport the patient. Put the patient back on the ambulance and take it down the street. Mm -hmm. And what happened? They put that patient into the CT, the person died inside the CT. Not the barber's fault, not the hospital's fault. Bad luck, yes. But when you have one CT, it's an extremely precarious situation. And, but it's called diagnostic equipment effects. It's not life support. Okay? So, repair time is not enough. Repair work orders. Okay, depends on kind of failure. We keep talking about failures here, thinking that every failure is the same. Electrical safety is an important thing, yes. But electrical safety of a ventilator, which is by definition, by support equipment, is not important. Because I'm yet to see a patient that can be shocked by a ventilator because the only connection is a bunch of plastic tubings. Right? So, wait a minute. That's not really an important thing. Okay? Likewise, depends what you call fail PMs. Like the discussion we're having. One to two, depends on what kind of failure. If you have a one critical failure to a PM, that could be very important. But if you have five failed fail PMs due to electrical safety on a ventilator or, or a infusion pump, even, it's not that critical. But if the infusion pump or the ventilator is not giving you enough proper volume, proper pressure, that is critical. That is definitely something you don't want to have. Right? So, unfortunately, none of these answers satisfy. Okay? So let's see. What can we do? I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because it's the same concept and I think I can do this a little better in a couple of minutes. Basically, the question here is that we have a lot of process measures, PM provisions, etc., etc. And process measures, and we are finding out after so many years, not just in government but also in education, is that you don't really want great students by class attendance. You don't know whether people attending class means anything. That's why we have to test the students, right? And we really need to look at the outcome, the evidence. And this is the same thing that the clinician has said. It you know, doesn't matter how many times the doctor, the nurse see the patient. It's really whether the procedure is right, the drug is right, something else is right. So, the issue here is really not doing things right, but doing the right things right. And the right thing is the tough one to, to answer. What is the right thing to do? Okay? And so I think the easiest way for me to explain this is that I'm a fisher, a new person. This is called fishing, right? And you guys recommend this is called catching. This is a process. <coughs> this is our outcome. If you do this really, really well, but know this, sorry, 
You're welcome. <laughs> okay? Does the mayor care? That, that, that's a small fish from around here. <laughs> so that's that's bait, that's that's bait here. here. <laughs> okay, okay. Actually, if you look in other industry, this whole thing is old, old history. One of the industries we very often like to compare ourselves to is that we need to learn from them from them is aviation. Okay. And this study goes back to 1968 when clinical engineering or biomedical engineering or the guys in the basement, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> were just very short starting to learn something. Okay. And these guys did a study and did the study was done by United Airlines. Or the, at that time, the new jets. Okay. And that's how they classify this. They have six types of failure, and this is for non structural equipment. In other words, we are not talking about the aircraft in terms of structure. We are talking about the engine, the, all the, the control systems, everything here. Okay. And the interesting part here is really this one 89% of the failures that they found cannot benefit from a limit of operating age. In other words, you don't go there and do something to it by replacing some part or, or changing oil or whatever you. This is not. Only 11% of failures are amenable to limit of operating age. Right. So in other words, the so-called PM, if we think PM here now for a second, as the true PM, PM you go there and replace something, replace oil, Replace lubricant, replace a part, replace a rubber or, or gasket, whatever you. In, even in aircraft, this is not what is really necessary most of the time. And this kind of study we have never done in medical group. Okay. Now, they have a significant advantage of us. In aviation, like it or not, when I look at talk aviation, to the best of my knowledge, things have two wings, or at least. Okay. And a few other things that are common from one type of so-called equipment to another type of equipment. We have something that is a tiny little device, pulse oximeter based, really miniature now, to something called a PET CT combined machine. Okay. And they have nothing in common really. Okay. And we need to understand what's happening there. So, Vincent? Yes. Um, we've had a couple of people ask if we can uh, adjust your volume a little bit. Sure. Do you mind if we take a break and, and give it a test with the people that are remoting in? Absolutely. Okay. So. Yeah, just, uh, we'll get some feedback from, from the field, if you will. Uh, from the folks out in the field. Yeah, have yourself to food here. No. And uh, if you just uh, make me talk, I can turn on a natural Is there any adjustments here? Uh, uh, Adam, who you met at the back table, he's a uh, He's fiddling around with the adjustments. <laughs> uh, what was that? Percussive maintenance? Uh, okay. Uh, as long as he's not going to deliver a shock to me. <laughs> oh, no, no. No shock. Hopefully. <laughs> Am I going too slowly or too fast? Or We're fine. Or whatever. It's okay? Guys? <laughs> They've got it to much of the criteria. It's good for a lot of the of time. Those are the two biggest best in the field. It's interesting to see how much further in detail I've explored what we're using with the other people Absolutely. No, ultimately, I'm going to go. Are they down? The problem is that, for us, time is something that you can't possibly have. Oh, is there somebody? 
and uh, what we can do to address it. There are issues that are in our head. So we can break it together. You have to get a question. You can get a question.
say yet. Yeah. No, I just went the one time I got the free piece. Yeah. 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 Uh, but one of the things I we what we're seeing feedback on in the past yeah. is that we may want to do with everybody in the room. So we may want to just go around and uh, we'll start with uh, Bob. Bob, can you can you briefly just mention your name, who you are? We'll do that around the room uh, very quickly so that people know who, who we are. That's why we also have the name that is. Bob Nanini. President of Biomed Engineering in Salt Lake City and I'm on the Board of ISIS. Travis Hall, Bob and his gopher. <laughs> Technician for Biomed. Uh, Dan, what kind of biomedical services out of uh, Idaho, uh, at Fort Murray in Idaho? I'm Kim Hansen, uh, Director of Captain Services for Greater Mountain Health I'm Mike Bustaker. I'm actually in here visiting. I'm an operations manager for clinical engineering for Alexa and Brothers Health System in Chicago, Illinois. The CW34 has worked with the uh, 807th uh, Command Medical Support Command down on Salt Lake City. The command maintenance warrant officer for all medical entities from Ohio to Hawaii and every all six state office which makes repairs in the military. They also fall under our umbrella, so it's pretty much why I come to these events so I can get the civilian side of the house and stay on top of the things as well. <laughs> I'm Mike Weiscarver. I'm a student at the OWAPC for Biomed. Ogden Weaver Applied Technology College. Where are we for you? <laughs> 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 Ogden Weaver Applied Technology College. Yeah, we're always high. Yeah, <laughs> so, so is the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> they do our school. Yeah. 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 Well, they all do. They're good. They're good. They're good. They're good. Let's go ahead. Uh, they can fight over who's going to recruit you. There are other companies, too, that will be looking at recruiting you once you graduate, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I'm Tyler James. I'm just kind of tagging along with her. I'm not going to biomed, but I am going into electrical engineering at Weber State, and I work for uh, Barnes Aerospace currently. So. You're just here for the food, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Probably. definitely. <laughs> I'm Dustin Beathers. I'm technician in training over at the old WATC. Ron Henderson. I'm studying at the ATC as well, uh, biomed. I'm Joe DeVito, Director of uh, Biomed or Clinical Engineering at uh, Jordan Valley and Pioneer Valley Hospitals, part of the Exodus group. Uh, Joe's being modest. He's also the Vice President. Several people haven't mentioned exactly what they're doing, but there's a yeah. lot of board members in this in this room. But he's, he's the real leader. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Corey Henderson. I'm from uh, Mount Healthcare. I work here at Katy Hospital. I'm an equipment tech in clinical engineering. This is uh, Mike Lipka. I'm calling from Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm an instructor with Varian Medical Systems and one of the board members. <laughs> Good job, Mike. <laughs> I'm Adam Drew. I, uh, Good practicing. <laughs> I work on the uh, website for ISIS and uh, I work here at the UK as an architect. So. And I'm Scott James. I'm the director of clinical engineering here at the and uh, do we have anybody from Boise on the audio? No? Uh, Beth? Yeah, actually, oh. actually we do. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Boise, let's, let's hear from you. Okay, so this is DC White Knack. I'm a uh, biomed at St. Luke's health system here in Boise. Um, I've been a biomed for 18 years. And... Uh, Enjoy being up here in Boise. Thanks a lot for letting us tune in. We're uh, experiencing some technical difficulties on our side uh, just because of the, uh, the way our system works here. But anyway, we're enjoying what's going on. Thank you. How's, how's the pizza? More of us here. How's the pizza? Um, gone. Gone. <laughs> gone. <laughs> 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 
may be an indication of good. Anybody else on the line want to? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Beth? No, we're not here. Yes. Yeah. This is Beth Ann Fiedler. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Central Florida, but also a biomed. And I'm actually doing my dissertation uh, based on a um, survey that I did within the biomedical engineering community. And Dr. Wang, thank you for your uh, presentation because it's always very interesting to see what you're doing with quality. Thank you. And uh, Rob, is it? Yeah, Rob Bell from Marquette, Michigan. Okay. I'm a manager of the clinical engineering department here. <laughs> and is uh, Fred Jaramillo from Colorado on? Yeah, it's Fred Hadamio from the University of Colorado Hospital, and I want to say that I, I think I took your survey on a PhD candidate from Florida, so hopefully that goes well for you. And uh, yeah, I'm having technical difficulties, and I'm listening in. Thank and you. Is, is there anybody else that's on the line that I forgot? This no, is Carol. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yes, Carol Wyatt. Carol Wyatt, yes, I'm from uh, Bay, we're out in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and I couldn't have uh, technical difficulties, but I've been listening in, and I've been enjoying this from the comfort of my recliner in my living room. <laughs> nice. Good. Uh, sounds like you guys aren't having any difficulty hearing me, but I'm generally allowed now because my coworkers can attest, and even the people outside of our shop down the hall some distance. But uh, uh, I think we have a possible proposal to our speaker. I'll, I'll talk about that with him, about how we can get the volume up without him having to yell. And uh, we hope that you still will stay on the call, those people that are remote. And I'll say this to the room and to everybody. It's interesting because uh, it, in part, we believe it's because of the presenter, but it's also because our community is really a relatively small profession. Um, I've met and and know a few of the people that are on the call remotely. Um, I've exchanged a few emails and never met some of them, like DC, for example, in Boise. But um, once you get into the field, especially for the students, you'll notice that you'll make uh, lasting connections with uh, people in the field uh, that may never, you may never even work with. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Mike here, he and I are connected through uh, LinkedIn, uh, professional networking site. This is the first time I've met him a little while ago, earlier today. We'll, we'll continue with the presentation after I give him the technical advice that we had. No, I've been saying the AV specialist said that because uh, this microphone is directly tied into the broadcast, mm -hmm. if you want to center yourself around that, uh, it'll, it'll probably help you. You, you can have that from this room, but it won't really help for the broadcast. Okay, so I have to close with that. Yes, we can move it to some other location, okay. but you have to kind of center around it. Okay. All right. My apologies for not communicating well before. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this is basically repeating what uh, was shown before the different patterns of failures and the what can you do about it. There are certain things that we can do proactively and there are certain things that we are active as we were discussing and for example natural safety is actually a reactive maintenance method and proactive one is really the true preventive maintenance in terms of preventing Again, these are theories. Okay, now let's go to the practical side. As I said, about two years ago we started this process of defining a small group of feeder codes that we can put to use at every single one of those 20 some sites. We started actually with about six and then we grew slowly. And we decided to use a very small number because I think all, all of you have, have that experience that when you have too many sites, you, I mean too many codes, uh, the users, the technicians get rather confused. And so they end up picking whatever they come uh, to their mind. And uh, typically, the first one on the list. So the first one on the list was always called, I'm an idiot. 
because that's the one that you discourage them to use, right? So we thought that for scheduling, we use the term schedule because we want to avoid the confusion with this preventive, okay? So it includes inspection, calibration, and true preventive measures. We have basically four types. Let me start from the bottom because that's the most common one. No problem found. You go there and do a inspection or you do a real PM, you replace parts, and then after you replace the part, you, you test the equipment, you run through the, and then nothing wrong with it, fine, no, no problem found. It's a very legitimate way of coding that particular warboard. Now, there are three others that we decided that we need to use. One is evidence failure. Failure that is already happened, it's evident to the user, that's why it's called evidence, but not reported by the user. You guys know, the, the user very often say, hey, I know that the light is not shining, but I don't care. <laughs> or that particular function of this monitor I don't use, so it's not working. I keep using, because I don't want to call you guys to take the whole machine away, because I can use the rest still. So when you go and do a schedule maintenance, you say, oh, there's something wrong, and we want to recognize it. Hidden failure. This is really what we are after when we do inspections. This is the, our good old friend, lateral safety. Another example. A ventilator is really a life support equipment, as, you, as we discussed before. And if there is a audible alarm, visual alarm, that for whatever reason became defective, is not working, and is not triggered in, under normal conditions, you never know that something failed. And then only when you go there and on purpose trigger that particular thing, then you go, oh, this is not working. What is the most obvious example to you guys on a day-to-day -day basis? Have you noticed when you go into a car, you put your key in, you turn, before you really start the engine, the whole panel should light up. If there is a bulb or something not lighting up there, you got a problem. And then when you turn the engine, all of them should go away. Right? That is the same thing that you we should have. Now, not all medical equipment has such capability of doing all the cell tests. A lot of them do, but they may still have some hidden failures that are not noticeable to the user. And these are the things that we are really trying to find during the so-called scheduling inspections. And potential failure is a slightly less serious situation. Something that is in the process of occurring but have not yet made the equipment fail. And that's why it is still a schedule made that is not a repair. Because if the repair, the failure already happened, then I would say, hey, come here and fix the damn thing because it's not working, right? So, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> A good example is a power cord that started to fray, okay, but has not interrupted the uh, electricity there, and then it's something that you need to worry about. Okay, the same thing has to be done on the corrective side. Why? Because looking at the schedule maintenance is looking on one side of the coin. There's another side of the coin. If you look only on one side, you miss something sometimes important, you only see on the the other side, which is the corrective side. Unpreventable failure is something that we know that happens quite often. Okay. Now, nowadays, for quite some time actually, I'm old, so you folks hopefully are young enough to don't know even what is the called uh, vacuum tube, but the old days of vacuum tubes. <laughs> uh, nowadays, solid state devices have these characteristics. You cannot predict when they're going to fail. Here, when they fail, there's nothing to do about it. Nothing can prevent a integrated circuit to fail. And the most common failure in all electromedical equipment, this has been documented in Chicago by uh, Mr. Collins, or I think you probably know him, John Collins, is uh, uh, board failures. Board failures is not to do about now, there are a number of figures associated with use. This is not user error. Don't, don't, don't get confused here, okay? 
these are factors induced by use. Abuse, somebody forced something there, abnormal wear and tear, heavy use, accident, somebody dropped the infusion pump on the floor, broke. Yeah, of course it's broken, but it was not because the equipment itself fell. Okay. But it does not include use error because use error is typically a misconception how the device should work and then was programmed in the wrong way and then you have a problem there but the equipment did not fail by itself. Preventable and predictive buffer. This is the kind of thing that we would like to catch. And this, if we had caught it, then it would be in the the scheduling inside, but we did not catch it, now it became a failure that we have to correct now. Okay. And a good example is overheating of a particular device because dust is accumulated. You mentioned about sand. This is something that you guys have to consider. If you see a lot of repairs due to sand, you need to think about, hey, I need to do something to prevent it from happening if I can. Sometimes you may not, but this is a good example of something that you need to think about. <coughs> service induced failure. This is something that we normally don't like to acknowledge is it's like asking doctors, have you ever made a mistake? They said, no, never made a mistake. Well, it's not really true, right? And also it's not just us, but also a part may have a failure that is known as the infant modality syndrome. In other words, a part that is barely put in there and then fails. One notable example of this is a well-known manufacturer of sterilizers, I guess you know the name. They did a study, they have a standard recommendation of replacing a certain valve in one of their machines four times a year. Well, these days they decided, to say, well, let's give it a try to replace only three times a year instead of four times a year. To their surprise, the reliability, the uptime, was higher with less replacement because that valve is notorious of having a lot of infant mortality problems. So you put it in there, it's very likely that in less than four weeks it will fail. Okay. And finally, cannot duplicate. We all know that. Somebody calls you this damn thing is not working, you go there, no. Okay. And we created a special code here but this is one of the old issues of different ways of doing things. Failure found during PMs. We still use PM, but that's how people like to remember you say scheduling is on the When we find a failure during scheduled maintenance, we create a corrective maintenance for code because there is a failure that you need to correct and we need then to assign a proper code for it. So we don't use two codes because then both will be you have two more orders for the same piece of code for the same problem, then you duplicate them. So we use this one, and this one is not counted before. Okay? So this is just... Now we come to something really interesting, is that we decided to segregate batteries, accessories, and more recently, this is just a few months ago, we decided to create a new code called NET. For well, batteries, obviously, pretty common, the other rechargeable batteries have problems that people forget to charge and it's become a real issue. Accessories, for example, pulse oximeter probe is a notorious problem. Okay. But this one is the uh, adaptation that we have to make to acknowledge that many, many and more and more medical devices are now networked. Very often the problem is not with the piece of equipment, but it's with the network interface or the network itself and other things that's happening behind it. So we need to segregate these things and find out what's the issue and how we can address it. By the way, my colleague is not here, but Dr. Martin Wijewey actually and some other friends and colleagues are the first one who started to use code. We only started at the idea from him and made some adaptations. Okay. All right, so this is the uh, set of data that I'm presenting today, although I did not have time to collect every single one in all the, this period of time, you can see it goes back to uh, 2008, okay, uh, and so, but some survey came in much later, we have different sizes, different uh, 
the teaching characteristics and as well as geographical locations, number of piece of equipment, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But basically we have a total of about sixty thousand pieces of equipment, hundred and thirty thousand work orders that we collected. We did not analyze every single one of them because this takes a lot of time to work down manually. Okay? Okay. Let me show you some of the data so you can appreciate how they look like. Okay. This is 24 consecutive months of a single China infusion house at a single hospital. Okay, 216 units. Every month they do some scheduling. They don't do all the time, all the three months at one time. So, and then they code this. So, no problem from accessory barriers, evident failure, hidden failure and potential failure. And this is only for scheduled maintenance. So you can see each month things are slightly different. There's no deterministic something. You sometimes you find some more, some less. But eventually you can see that the very last one here, the white one with the bars on top are the averages and standard deviations. So they fluctuate but they have tend to be somewhat similar to each other whereas very seldom they have problems here. Okay. Some no accessory problem, very few of these, some things here and here, occasionally. Okay. Now let's look at the repairs. Repairs is very different. And they have a different codes, right? Although some codes are, are common. Accessory and barriers are common. Yes sir. Uh Beth uh, on the uh, online thing wants to know what type of metrics should we collect in order to predict failure. For example, should we start sharing failure data with uh, components and age of equipment and make your master database? Uh, we don't have analysis to that level of detail. Right now, our data is grouped by what we call equipment type. Equipment type is, for example, single channel infusion problem. Another group type is multi-channel infusion problem. We don't distinguish between brain A model 1, brain B model 2, or something like that yet. The next step we're going to do is to go into groups of more specific brains and models that we have some uh, more details about it. Because in the beginning, when we had small number of participants, small number of records, we wanted to use the law of large numbers in order to get some averages. When you have five or six records, you don't really have an average. Okay, so we wanted to also find out how many records you need to get something that becomes roughly recognizable. Because from month to month, you can see variations can be very big. Well, is that because of different brands of models, or because we have different users, because this came from different hospitals, and some different users, right? So we want to establish some basic rules of behavior of this thing before we start digging into more details. And for example, the age may be well a problem, maybe not. But until we can compare, we don't know. Okay. Alright. So, yes, sir. I'm a little confused here about okay. your, your, your la this slide and the last slide. Okay. The last slide you had the PM, which is PM. Yeah, okay. Uh, and no problem, no problems found on, on your scheduled maintenance forms. Right. Okay. Uh, to me, on, on a scheduled maintenance, mm -hmm. and maybe, maybe I'm looking at this wrong. And then on your corrective maintenance, you've got a big influx of battery inputs. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, if a battery fails, usually I like to say, "Come and fix it," because it's not working. Right. So that's that's different. We very seldom find a bad battery during scheduled maintenance. However, there sometimes a piece of equipment if you were sitting there for a long time, the users have not used it, the battery went back. I find most of my dead batteries on scheduled or on scheduled maintenance. That could be well that be the case in your particular situation. I'm not saying that it's not possible because it depends very much on the use, the pattern, the utilization rate. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. It says, and we're just opposite. I just found the way he stated the So that they're calling you from the floor and says this pump yes. doesn't work and you go ahead and replace the battery. Same thing. That's the or way plug it in. Yeah. <laughs> or plug, yeah, plug, plug it in. Yeah, plug, 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 plug it in. Yeah. You, you take it down you know, and plug it in for a while. It may not necessarily be that it was a battery failure. It's it failed because of the battery. Right. Because the battery was dead. Because they didn't plug it in. Yeah. It does not necessarily mean that you had to replace the battery. Well, here again, I, I guess I need a little, a little more definition because to me that would not be a battery failure. That would be a use failure where the, the operator didn't plug, keep the pump plugged in. Yes. You, you, you know, here again, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm def, maybe got some different definitions in my own head. You touched a good point that I was going to discuss later, but since you raised the question, let's talk about it now. When we started this, a lot of people had a lot of concerns about it. A lot of people, meaning our biomedics, had a concern about this. Because, first of all, this is not a factual coding of things. Mm -hmm. This is not PCB fail or power supply fail, right? Yeah. So they said, hey, wait a minute. You are asking me to make a judgment call. Mm -hmm. What happens if I made a wrong judgment call? Well, one particular failure has actually more than one factors here which you call to any use. Very good questions, indeed. First, the answer to judgment call is yes, we are asking to make a judgment call because by documenting which part fell, which part did you replace, does not help us as the people who have to do the day in, day out maintenance. Helps the manufacturers to know what kind of parts they have that is unreliable. Yes, for them it's very helpful, but for us, it does not address the problem except maybe for the spot in some parts, right? So for us, judgment call is important because that help us understand which maintenance strategy should we adopt or should we change. Second, if you make a bad call today, fine, tough luck. Tomorrow, we are going to have thousands of records. When you have one mistake here, one mistake there, things get washed out. You have, you have, you have outliers. Exactly. Exactly. That's the, the power of statistics here. Yeah. Okay? To me, those numbers, when you're looking at those numbers there, the no problem bounds on the scheduled maintenance. And you look at the corrective maintenance, when you look at your corrective maintenance with mm -hmm. battery failure, it's obvious that your scheduled maintenance is not going to prevent those battery failures. It didn't. It hasn't yes. prevented them. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, so I understand. Now, when you have more than two codes that you could pick from, our rule is that think about which one will help you address a sound issue later. Okay, if it's a battery problem, it's a, you're right, it's, a lot of that is educational, but it's something that would be better off isolated from other use problems. You know, but use problem can be Somebody accidentally dropped the right. pump. Some a lightning hit the electrical system. Everything put it out. That's a use problem, right? And so definitely not but now, right. So so battery. If the failure, called, the work order was called in because of a battery that was dead because somebody forgot to plug in. It's easier to. Make sure that is the case because then we can go back to the users and say, look, you guys need to be refreshed in training. The batteries need to be plugged in, otherwise it's not good. Or maybe another possibility is to have a team of people who help you clean the infusion pump after each use and plug them into the outlet to be charged until somebody needs the pump again. So that's another way of addressing the problem. In other words, Codes are used, it's the old garbage in garbage shop. Don't put a lot of codes. If you have a like hundred codes, you've got a whole lot of codes that you cannot decide for you, are not going to get anything useful out of it. But if you know which codes are going to help you address the problem with the users or manufacturers or whatever you, then use those codes. Okay? All right. So now we are going to make another jump here is that how we're going to combine the data. Combine the data meaning combine the one side of coin called schedule maintenance, the other side of coin called corrective repairs, right? We define something called annual failure probability. It's 
when you grab a piece of equipment, what during a year, what is your probability of finding a problem that is due to battery or due to accessory or due to a hidden failure or something? That's how you really want to address it. You don't want to address the schedulement on one side because we have things that are common. For example, the accessories, batteries are common, right? So what we want to do is for this schedule maintenance, we have these codes. For the these are the codes for the repairs. So we want to calculate the probability this way. Number of codes divided by number of work orders completed. But the failures found during repairs has to be adjusted by a factor here because let's say in future pump, you schedule in future pump to be performed once per year for every device. And assume that you are perfect, you never miss it. The schedule maintenance, then this is exactly your statistics, right? However, repairs is that not every infusion pump get calling for repairs. So you cannot say the number of codes divided by the number of repairs are completed is exactly your failure rate because you have to multiply that by the number of units that you have during the year. Otherwise, you are doing unfairly. Uh, we say, okay, I have 50 of the 100 pounds failed, so the failure rate count only of the 50 number. There are other 50 that did not count, so we'll drop the number to half, right? The scaling factor. Exactly. Accessory value we have to combine, and no failures, oops, too fast. No failures is then at the end of one minus sum of all the others, there is no failure. Okay, so if you do this exercise, again, the same statistics I showed you before now combine. No failures, Unpreventable failures, accessory failures, battery failures, use, evident failures, service use, hidden failures, potential and predictable and preventable. These last four are so small, I expanded the scale so you can see. Okay? Alright. Again, this is single hospital, same set of users, the same random model of equipment, okay? So it still has a lot of fluctuations. Inevitable. Okay. But there is a tendency. You, you put your eyes here. Yeah. Most of the problems is due to battery. No question about it. Use and no fails are second. These are not really that many issues. Okay. Alright. This is for a single hospital. Okay. Let's still continue to look at single hospital. The same group. Now I'm going to do a little trick on you because this is how we're going to compare things later on. So I want to show the same as year one, year two. So then I can collapse all those things and show you the averages and standard deviation. So you can see the age problem, for example, we could analyze this, but we need several years of data and start seeing whether there is a deterioration with the equipment and then whether we need to do capital planning for replacement. Right? So this is going to help us later. But we are not there yet. Okay? Alright. A single hospital, a different hospital actually, uh, with 174 units of, uh, of uh, vital science monitors, we have similar behavior. Okay? No failures, unpreventable failures, etc. etc. There's a huge spike here. We don't know what happened. Whatever it is, it is. Okay? Again. Another single hospital for patient monitors. See variations again. Every time we calculate the average and standard deviation. Okay? So what I'm trying to basically help you see is that you are going to see these kind of patterns over and over for, for each single hospital, each, each single type of equipment. But now how what happens if we put multiple hospitals together. In this case, I choose electrical surgical units. Do something different. Here is a list of hospitals. Some have as few as three, and some have as many as 37. Okay. Now, they're not the same, but they are not so widely different as we saw before. In a single hospital, we had very similar large fluctuations as well, but they still have roughly the same pattern again. Okay. Even though these are different hospitals, different users, and 
very possibly different brands and models and different ages of equipment. So what I'm trying to say here is that after we look at this many, many times with many, many things, we start to see, hmm, it seems that different types of equipment have some pattern that is reproducible somewhat from place to place. Because at the end of the day, electrosurgical units are obviously have different design, different uh, manufacturing processes, different parts, etc. But they serve the same purpose. They are not exactly radically different from one manufacturer to another. In fusion pumps, they are not so radical. Sometimes, of course, it's not legitimate to compare, for example, a syringe pump versus a volumetric pump, etc. But when you have somewhat similar things, they tend to have similar behaviors. Okay. Another example, electronic thermometer. This one here is a little cleaner in the sense that we have a large amount of units. And so you have le less uh, significant variations because the uh, law of large numbers in statistics help you smooth out things. Okay. But still no question about it. All the things tend to be on this first six and very few things happen on the last four. Okay. And, and there is a reason I did not use, we did not use alphabetic order here because we are going to group things and you'll see why. Okay. Multiple parts of defibrillators, again, these kind of things. Once in a while you will find somebody significantly different from the others. And this particular one actually we found out what's the issue. This one here is unfortunately a very common problem in some hospitals. Some hospitals insist that the users unplug the different to test the different and then have to plug the different back to be charged. And it's not so uncommon that users unplug, test, and walk away and the different dies. Okay. And this is what's happening here. This particular huge spike spike is because of that. Obviously it became very obvious what needs to be done, talk to the users, etc., etc., and maybe perhaps even changing the procedure, because unpacking the different it, the test does not really do any good at all. I don't know whether you guys bother to calculate the discharge. The energy discharge is very, very small. It does not really constitute a good test of the battery that powers the different at all. Okay, so. How we are going to use this thing? Just showing the graphs here is not going to do much, right? So we are going to compare values and different values values and see whether we can determine the factor. Because at the end of the day, we are basically going back to the initial question. You do by OEM recommendation or you do by some other words. So let's compare the two. It's like, again, why we borrow the name evidence-based Maintenance from the clinicians is evidence-based medicine, right? Evidence-based medicine says, says what? I do, I give this group of uh, patients a drug, another group, I give them a different drug or even a placebo, and let me see the difference in the outcome. If there's a difference in the outcome, the drug is good. If there's no difference in the outcome, the drug is useless, right? This is exactly what I'm saying. Let's see the effectiveness of different maintenance strategies, okay? And there's another thing that we could do. Look at the groups of the failures and compare what we do currently, scheduling to repair, etc., and other activities that we could potentially do and reduce equipment failures. Because at the end of the day, whether the problem is accessories, is used, is batteries, or something, it's still a failure for the user and it is still a problem for the patient because like we were discussing you the army said to you we want high reliability equipment because i cannot be without his equipment if i got a wounded soldier there right so how do i do that do i just focus on my schedule maintenance and unscheduled maintenance or do i do something else as well okay so let's move on okay we have also two different possible both ways of comparing maintenance strategies. One is what we call lateral comparison, and meaning you compare side by side. 
with two different, okay, for example, you have intermodal here, you have several hospitals, so you could go to one hospital which also takes another hospital which also, okay? And another one would be called longitudinal. It's like what I did with one hospital, year one, year two, and see whether there is any difference. Or maybe I change the main strategy from one year to another, and I compare, it's good, because I have single could use the same, I just change strategy from one year to another and I have the results compared. Okay. This one takes more time. This one can be done in parallel, but there are some disadvantages because you may have different users, different models, etc. etc. Okay, let's do some lateral because that was where we were going first. And here are the codes we use just to make this simple. Fix every three months, fix every six months, fix every 12 months. Statistical sampling, repair or replace. Okay. All right. So we grouped our hospitals into two groups: quarterly and semi-annual schedule maintenance for defibrillators. And in average, all the other things. In this case, unfortunately, we had only one single one that was doing quarterly, and the rest were doing semi-annual. Okay. So this. One here is a single hospital, so there's no standard deviation on top of it. The rest are averages and standard deviations. When you have something that the the red one is within the symbol, the bar size is a or not that they're different. This could be different, but yeah, but the difference could be very well different users, different things. But here you have one that oh, this could be something to worry about. Okay. All right, next, vital science model. Now we have three strategies here. Sampling, annual, and something. We don't really do any scheduling methods whatsoever. We prepare or replace these things. Again, we can compare things. Okay. Another one, pulse oximeter. Same thing. Sampling, annual, repair, replace. Okay. So, this is a method that we can use to answer the question. Is OEM recommendation better? Is six months better? Twelve months better? Or I just let it run to failure? Okay, I can give you concrete evidence because, as we discussed before, the number of failed PMs is not by itself a good method because if I do maintenance exactly as recommended by the modifier, I probably will find some amount of failures as well. Okay, it could be serious, could be not serious. The, the severity will be shown here. So let's compare things. So I'm going to skip over this because yeah, it essentially is the same. Okay, warmers, except the thermometers. Okay, the thermometers. A lot of people don't repair at all, and some we still have some that insist on annual inspections. Okay, the bottom line is the question: How the result? How do we prove that we are not shortcutting and shortchanging the patients? Right. So, if we compare and the failure rates. According to OEM recommendation, in my maintenance strategy, is there's no significant difference. You really cannot put that I'm doing anything wrong, right? If you find difference, then you have to change maintenance strategy and you have to improve. Now, what is a significant difference is still something to be debated, but at least you can show the graphs to the, to for example, somebody that comes in to serve you and say, well, if I just says to check the models every 12 months, I check. And, but some others say, we only want to attempt to fail it. I don't see any significant difference here. Why you want me to go and check every single tomorrow? Okay? All right. By the way, our position, and this is just our thinking, is that we rather not use repair, replace, or want to failure because I think we lose sight of things too quickly. As was mentioned here, different aging, aging is a problem that may affect different groups in different uh, places, in different ways. And if you just let it run to fade until you find from the statistics 
there's something wrong with that group curcuma, it may take you a long time. So you may want to keep a tap on situation. And some people don't feel comfortable with statistics, in statistical science, but this is really nothing new. This is happening in healthcare every day. Okay. And actually, the same thing came from the military. Way back when, in the First World War, the soldiers started to complain that bullets were not really firing. They said, whoops, we've got a problem here. Right? But on the other hand, you cannot test every bullet after it's manufactured, right? Okay. <laughs> so you've got a little problem here. So what do you do? You do a sample. And that's the same thing we have today. All the surgical, sterile surgical girls, all the uh, implants that you do, you sterilize it, you check ster sterility, you, you, you don't open every single box, right? You have to do by sample. So, our clinical colleagues are very used to this. Patient studies is done on statistics because you cannot do every single patient, right? And that's also part of the reason we don't do every single site. We believe it's better to limit to a few sites because it takes long time to train and get good clean data out of those places and try to get everybody to do, but they don't need to do the right thing and then you've got a garbage in, garbage out situation. Okay. So, let's go a little further, as I said before. The data actually tells us a little more than what we had the initial thought about. Right. We are required to do improvement. Even if you are not part of the so-called DNV healthcare, it's a different accreditation organization that follows the ISO 9001 principles, the Joint Commission still says that you should think about performance improvement, the so-called PI activities, right? So let's take a look. To deal with all these codes is a little bit cumbersome. So we said, okay, let's think about grouping things here. What can we do about this? For example, no problem found, obviously there's nothing to be done because there's no problem found. Now, unpreventable failure. What can you do about unpreventable failure? Board failures. There's really nothing you can do about it, except that maybe you can help the purchasing people in the future to buy a more robust piece of equipment. If you bought a lemon, or did that particular manufacturer is putting out junk, you go and talk to the capital committee and say, look, let's not buy it from those guys anymore. <coughs> or you've heard from other colleagues, hey, that piece of equipment is not very good, don't buy it, right? Now, all these things, here, accessory barriers, network issues, use issues, evidence failure issues. These are all things outside of the traditional environment or whatever you want to call department. And so we call that indirect. And all these things here at the bottom are the ones that we truly can do something about. Okay. Service induced failures. You can train staff, talk to the manufacturers, hey, the, you, the part that you are supplying us is having a lot of different mortality problems. Schedule maintenance problems that need to be revised because you are finding repeated hidden problems, electrical safety problems, uh, alarm time, etc. Potential failures, things are happening, and predictable preventable failures, same getting to the improve. So these things I need to do something about, and these are direct. Now, now you understand why we order the sugar codes in this way. That's the funny way we order, because actually they line up with these three categories. And now it's pretty clear. This group here that we have been focusing our attention all the time is actually the least of all numbers. Okay. So a way to see that is through the pie chart. You put this on pie chart, the right is here. So don't you have the impression that we are beating on, on a dead horse here? This thing is one to what? Three percent. And so we go to the hospital safety committee, the safety officer, CEO, whatever. We are going to reduce our figures to by half. By half. Yeah. Very good. You're going to reduce from two percent to one percent. Does that really matter to me? 
Okay. You can say that. Yes, sir. I uh, got a question from the uh, online. It says, uh, it's here. do you think the future of biomedical engineering techs will include statistical analysis and interdepartment management? Uh, say the last part again. Uh, it's here. Statistical analysis and? Yeah, it's just statistical analysis and interdepartmental management. Uh, First answer to the interdepartmental, absolutely positively yes. Okay. Statistical analysis is simply a tool. You don't need to study college level statistics to do things. The people who are manufacturing cars, manufacturing TV sets or whatever you, they all follow the same rules. There are lots of standard tables that are developed and published, etc. etc. in People just need to understand how to follow the rules. Now, certain people in your organization need to understand why they are doing those things and how to apply those things, etc., etc. But not every single person needs to be a statistician to uh, be able to become a biomed or a you know, manager. But you need to have some basic idea. But, but that's a, a matter of going to the casino and toss a few coins that are into that machine and know what the statistics are about, right? I think that you will learn that very quickly. But, sorry for the joke, but basically, you will have some basic notions there. But the important thing that I want to point out, as I said, we seem to be focusing a lot of energy on what we can look at, and we are ignoring this indirect part. This indirect part is particularly big in the single channel infusion part or multi-channel infusion problems. And this is the classical problem that the FDA, AAMI, and a number of organizations are addressing. And this is another one of these, which is common to all these guys, is the alarm problem. We have a horrendous use error problem that is really not user's fault, but it's particularly challenging here because we have so many devices with so many different designs and users are fully trained, if trained at all, to deal with these things and then we keep on the figure. You don't know what you're doing. No. We are the ones who really need to go and help them. This is, as you can see, it's an order of magnitude bigger, 10 times bigger than looking at equipment. So coming back to the good question that came online. Talk to the users. Don't talk to the equipment. Although the equipment is our patient, the people who really need help are the users. So if we want to help the patients, go and help the users. Because we cannot fix the patients, right? We don't put our hands on the patient. So this is the opportunity, this is the need. The future part is unfortunately only the future. And this future part, even here, you can see it's too big because we have a lot of badly designed, badly manufactured fusion parts on the market. Okay, here I'm going to go uh, very briefly into theory. Risk management. We talk about the risk, risk classification, risk criteria, etc. If you think more carefully, we are actually using the wrong term. Okay. Risk is really defined as probability times severity. Okay. If you look in the dictionary, risk is the combination, or this is the definition, but if you look into the dictionary, it's really saying that the risk of something happening depends on how severe the problem is, how uh, often it's likely to happen. For example, I came here on the airplane. Yeah, it's, it's definitely risky. Something happens to a couple hundred people, they die. It's very severe. But what is the probability of that happening coming down? Not that high. I live something like less than 10 miles from a nuclear reactor. If that thing goes bad, like what happened in Japan, how many million people can die? Chernobyl, right? But how often that happens? Very, very small. And it's the responsibility of people who manage the thing to reduce this probability. Okay. Now, 
we keep focusing our attention on severity, that thing is a life support. Yeah, but how often that thing happens? On the other hand, something that is not life support, is not severe, in theory, can happen a lot of times. And that is the, the risk that we need to address. Okay, so how do we estimate the risk? How many people here know this Swiss cheese model of risk? Okay. All right. Let me go explain this very quick. This is a model developed by a person with the name of Dr. Neeson from the UK, which is a very easy graphical way to understand risk. Okay. When you have a stack, this is not one chunk of Swiss cheese. But a stack of slices of switches, each one of them has holes, big ones, small ones. <laughs> if the holes are not exactly lined up, then the ray of light is unlikely to go through all the way because it will bounce off one of the slices and then get reflected, right? So the way to manage risk, to manage a nuclear reactor to manage a spacecraft out there is to put several layers of protection. If the first one fails, the second one will catch it. If the second one fails, the third one will catch it. That's how you reduce risk. Okay? So you want to, in other words, put as many slices as you can with as few holes and as small holes as you can because there is no such a thing as perfect. We are not perfect, we cannot design perfect. So we can just do redundancies and reduce the holes. Okay? So we want to estimate the probability of something happening. We are using we are going to use the annual probability of failure. That's why we call calculate that probability. Okay? So this is the, the situation. A real accident happens when everything is lined up. Then that's what is going to kill a patient or injure a patient. So what we are going to do is we are going to use probability we calculated and estimate the severity and then calculate what is the risk. Now, we have a little problem here is that we are actually only one slice of this stack. Whether you want to call it engineering, power engineering, whatever, we are one slice because the users represent another slice. The Doctor, physician, surgeon who prescribed that treatment is another slice, etc., etc. So we want to be perfect, but no, we cannot be perfect, but we want to reduce the holes, etc. But we want to help others put as good slice up as possible. But right now we have only a way to calculate our own slice. So we are going to use this is our slice. Okay? So a lot of numbers here, I'm not going to test your eyesight with this. But this is the old technical model. Okay, this has been calculated and let's say something like 13 and above is included and the rest is excluded. Right? And all these things that we have here. Now if you think about the probability we calculated, this is for all the different groups of the equipment, then we can use this probability and then we can assign a severity. Severity is assigned in the traditional way, whether this is going to affect the patient directly. Obviously, the life support will go up very quickly, but there are certain devices that have very high numbers in spite of not necessarily being a life support piece of equipment. Okay? But whatever number you want to give, you can calculate, and then the risk now is Again, okay, using the probability and multiply that by severity. Now, I put an arrow here, you can see, an IBP monitor is a low risk device, and uh, error probability and in the technical model will not even be included, right? And the probability of failure is in the direct side, as typically our things is less than 2%. Okay. But there is quite a bit of problems on the user side, mm -hmm. right? Now, when you put this together, all of a sudden, 
And I believe you can fairly high here in the overall risk because of the indirect factor. So what I'm trying to say is the following. You take an NIBP, which is really a very simple device. There's nothing to do to fix that piece of equipment. However, it has an accessory that has a lot of problems because of very many hospitals have come cheap and bought the so-called single-use pressure cups they used multiple times. And then they start leaking and then users say, everything's not working again. Fix it. So you go and you place the cup. Because there's nothing wrong with the piece of equipment. So uh, what's the other solution? Train the users better, train the purchasing economy better to buy better cups. Mm -hmm. That's the solution. Right? So at the end of the day, if we refocus our attention, you can see the numbers here don't match up with these numbers here anymore. So we need to think more carefully, not just whether it's severe or not, but it is really necessary to take care of something because the probability of failure is higher or not. The person who used to be in George Mills' position uh, before George uh, took over, uh, his name is Britt Barrick, some of you know him. And with many times, when he was at the Commission, he came to a national meeting and said, wait a minute, think carefully about what you do in terms of maintenance schedule, maintenance special. High risk is not equal to high maintenance. High risk is just high risk. High maintenance is something else. Okay. You have a patient monitor in the ICU. If a patient is in ICU, obviously it's critical, otherwise he or she would not be in ICU, right? But that patient monitor is not necessarily a high maintenance piece of equipment. It can be a very good solid state piece of equipment that you really don't need to do anything to it until it fails because there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. So don't confuse things. Anyway, so we need to change our concept from the direct things that we would pay a lot of attention to the things that affect the users the most here. So, okay, graphically it's easier to see this by looking at the size of the chunk. Okay. Now, we, if we average all 22 types of, of equipment, okay, this includes no failure, this excluding no failure becomes easier to see, but anyway, we're still talking about 3% for direct, 22% for indirect, and future is 16%. In other words, we are still beating on the dead horse. Okay. All right, how can you improve your performance? These ones, we have really very little changes we can make. Maybe we can increase frequency, add a few tests, but here is the great opportunity. This is really, really something we can do about. This is something that we can only do something in the future. Okay, conclusion. We are reaching our limits in terms of directing what we can do but we can do a whole lot more with our users. And the NIBP monitor example I showed, and zero PMU, that was the, the thing that we discussed before. That's really not the right measure. Yes, sir. Got a, another online question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that OEM will ever share their failure data uh, in a corporate effort to give us probability rates so that we can cause, uh, oh, so that we can use the concept of statistical, or concept of statistical sampling. I would not be surprised that some OEMs do share. I mentioned an example of a sterilizer manufacturer, although uh, that is somewhat rare. Uh, let's put ourselves in their shoes. You make a device, and you are under intense scrutiny not only by the government but by your customers as well as by your competitors. So if you start saying to many things, showing to many things, you can run a of problems. For example, the FDA can say, you're having too many problems, you need to do a recall. They don't like that. Right? Another thing is that your legal department says, are you out of mind? Because if you say, you can do schedule maintenance 
maybe once every two years instead of once every year. And something happens. Ah, it's your fault. Something happened. You said it's okay. Skip it. Right? So it's a natural attitude of most manufacturers. If I were in their shoes, I would definitely be as stringent as possible. It's the same thing you have in your car. When you go buy a car, the car manufacturer will certainly tell you that you need to change your oil, does you? As often as 5,000 miles, 7,000 or 10,000 miles. But let's be honest, if you are, I hope no one gets offended here, but in a very bad neighborhood, in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., all of a sudden you see your car, and obviously 10,000 miles, do you stop and change oil? You don't. You know that you're going to be okay, there's a tolerance there. If, if you have a flat tire, you probably will say, I'm keep going here because I'm not stopping here. Right? Depends on the circumstances. Now, if you take your car, the same car, that says 7,000 miles origin to a one of those national chains that change oil, they're going to put a sticker there that says, oil change at this next change 3,000 miles later. Why 3,000 miles later? It's not recommended by the factory, but it's a good business sense for them. And it also protects them. You didn't change your, your engine. When a put no, no, my problem, you didn't follow my recommendation. So they're not going to share that. And to be honest, they don't have that much experience. You are the guys who have the experience. Once they sold those infusion pumps to you, infusion pumps belong to you, do belong to manufacturers. How often you schedule maintenance or you repair? They don't know. They don't have the records. A lot of the stuff their dad they do is actually from the people out in the field to correct those errors. Well, it's, it's, it's a best guess they, they can give you when you buy a new set of equipment from the manufacturers. My guess is this thing will probably last uh, 12 months, 24 months, but we will see. I'm not going to go out the limb and say, okay, well, 26 months is okay, right? So that's unfortunately the reality of our overall environment here. Any more questions? Uh, okay, so let's move on. So in essence, we really would like to see everybody reaching out to the comfort zone and <coughs> talk more. Uh, in our mind, we have adopted a uh, process we call this, uh, is, uh, developed by somebody called Studer, Studer, Studer Principle, uh, the name of the person, Queen Studer, is to run <coughs> periodically with your customers. We force our people to go out and talk regularly with the uh, key department managers, supervisors, etc., etc., for the purpose exactly to understand what's the problem they face. This is not going to, to get a piece of code and say, hey, can you help me find this part so I need to PM and, and walk away? No, talk to the users, see what the users really need. Okay? All right. Oh, uh, some quick hints. If you are interested in using this code, uh, this code, as I said, we stole it from uh, MasterPen before we bought MasterPen. So <laughs> it's not a secret, uh, it's not ours. Uh, uh, one little trick we learned is that if you want to put in the computer system, uh, since you cannot erase the old codes uh, uh, because of relation databases, uh, once you put a code in, you, you have to keep it there. You put uh, a number in front, so you will always come up to the top, and so people will uh, pick them very easily. Uh, we discuss uh, and encourage the staff that we discussed that before, how you choose the right code, what happens if you choose the wrong code, etc. etc. And, and this is a, a, a difficult process. Monthly verification, make sure people are doing the right thing. Our typical experience is three months. Before three months you are not going to be able to correct good reliable data. And this is just human nature. You are changing the culture, you are changing things. This is your roast beef problem. Okay. So give time to people to do the right things. So basically we're trying to involve with the rest of healthcare progress of 
couldn't design a fraction of The model fraction have done a very good job in general. And uh, we have to think about the mission criticality concept, like the CT scan example I gave. It's not just whether it's uh, therapeutic or diagnostic. And also, we should segregate the risk and maintenance needs, is what I mentioned before, uh, what I uh, used to say. High uh, criticality doesn't mean high maintenance. Okay? And uh, reliability sector maintenance is something that we learned from other industries, the aviation industry called that uh, reliability sector. And that there is a little detail there that is a little bit more cumbersome is that in that industry, everything is regulated by FAA, but there are very few manufacturers if, uh, and also a limited number of users. The number of elements is not that huge. The number of healthcare institutions is horrendously large. And so there's a whole lot better cooperation between the manufacturer side and the user side, which is something we don't have. And the FDA is very adamant that you shall not modify the piece of equipment. So if you modify the piece of equipment, not only the manufacturers will wash their hands, but also your legal department is probably going to hand you out to dry very quickly. Okay? And because uh, RCM, one of the main things is that if whenever there is a significant risk of injury to the user or to a patient, customer in this case, uh, you have to modify the piece of equipment. So basically, we're trying to evolve from a subjective craftsmanship type of environment to scientific evidence base. And we focus our attention from schedule maintenance to something that is really more important for the users and therefore for the patients. At the end of the day, we are really talking about engineering. Engineering is basically balancing constraints and needs and see what you can do. Find a middle solution. We are not like a science that is about the truth regardless of the cost. Okay? We are not about money, financials only. We have to balance the two sides. Okay. Bottom line is we have to prove to the regulatory agency that we are not so changing the patients and uh, from the DBA for the recommendations. And uh, will allow us to move beyond combined with this and really enhance the user satisfaction and patient safety. And also let us have a to review and prove continuously what we are trying to do. Okay? And really that our employers, the People who pay us, healthcare organizations, are using resources in a really productive, efficient manner. Because nowadays, you know, with healthcare reform or whatever changes is coming, nobody is really having the opportunity to be indulging in money. Okay, I spent quite a bit of your time. Questions? Yes? I, I have a couple. I'll start off with this one. Um, mm -hmm. How would you, how do you believe is the best way to, to set the, the target at first when you acquire new technology or newer technology that's different from some existing uh, technology that you currently have? Where do you set your, set your sights on scheduled maintenance? Mm -hmm. um, if there's a need for scheduled maintenance, you use an OEM uh, guideline, which, which I believe OEMs don't know very much about their own equipment when it comes to how much preventative or scheduled maintenance is due? Or do you use some somebody else's history if they have it with that equipment? Good question. Uh, we always consult the manufacturer's recommendation as a starting point. Uh, because, again, we know that they are likely to be very conservative, very self-protective, but at least in theory, they are the ones who knows the best about their own improvement. So let's start to use that as start starting point. If they have something that is strange or very different from our past experience with similar equipment, we say, let's take a look how other equipment of similar characteristics, similar 
type of manufacturing, etc. Shoes. So that is one of the benefits. I'm not trying to uh, be a marketing person for our market, but when you have other hospitals in the group that have similar experiences, you can take a look and say, hey, what is your experience there? What is your experience there? Is it? Let's take a look. Let's compare notes. Now, if we still cannot comfortably resolve that, we, unless it's a really low risk device, we'll probably go with the manufacturer recommendation first, start accumulating a little bit of experience, and as soon as we feel comfortable saying, this thing does not make sense, we will go to the safety committee and propose a change. And when we propose a change, and by that time, we would have accumulated, let's say, a year of that. So we say, okay, we have a year of fatal codes accumulated. We propose a change. If you allow us to change, we will keep using the same codes, exactly the same codes, but only a different maintenance strategy. For example, changing from six months to a year. And during that next 12 months, we keep accumulating and we keep comparing back. And if we see anything different, that is detrimental, we'll stop and go revert back to the old path. If we don't see any different at the end of the year, we come back and show you the two sets of data and say, these are the two sets of data. What do you think? We don't see any difference, we propose to keep going. And we keep monitoring again. We will never stop monitoring. We'll always keep monitoring with the same method, the same people, etc. And we keep fine-tuning it. Now, again, if we have the luck of having this device, new device, but simultaneously in five or ten hospitals, that give us the great opportunity to collect that more quickly. Because when you have five pieces of equipment here, five pieces of equipment there, it's really difficult to accumulate enough that it's statistically significant. But when you have 10, 15, things are a whole lot easier. Well, that, that leads to my next question, and yes. is that do we as an industry have a, some commonalities or should we adopt some, the, the language that you've proposed or that ASHI has worked on or, or the ASHI group, do we, do we as an industry have the responsibility to try and share that information across the board so that, say for example, Intermountain Healthcare um, shares information or has access to information that IASIS, Healthcare, and Biomed Engineering Incorporated and Aramark all have. I know that might be difficult, but is do you, do you see that there could be some common data sets that we could, we could look at? Well, I can say I wish. I cannot <laughs> say it will happen. That's what these groups are, I thought these groups were designed to do, help us to share that information. Yeah. Uh, my colleagues and I have uh, gone to several meetings like this uh, a few months ago. Two months ago, we were in California with the MD Expo. Uh, we have been uh, in, in Illinois, uh, in Florida, etc. Uh, in some places, uh, we were fairly well received. In some places, we almost got stoned out of the building. <laughs> well, we left all our rocks outside tonight. So oh, I see. <laughs> thank you. You just told me to the lake here. <laughs> the geese outside. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really cannot be so pretentious as saying, hey, we want everybody to follow us. No. Uh, but our position is important. We want to do what's right for our clients and for our industry, our profession. We are willing to share the things. That's why we're here. We don't have any clients here. That's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, we are publishing everything. Uh, I have uh, received feedback from as far away as New Zealand. Got the email from New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting idea. Oh, wow. <laughs> New Zealand, uh, yeah, Australia. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, copy the codes or uh, choose your uh, own codes to something different or uh, we'll prove us wrong. Uh, we're open. We are definitely not uh, trying to impose anything. Uh, and all we want to do is help everybody to think more carefully about this issue that we have 
for many, many years being focused a little bit too much on the equipment, on the completion rates, they have not uh, opened our eyes to the bigger horizon. What the users really need us to do, okay, that's one thing. And the other thing is, what are the real payback for, for our efforts? We do PM to PM care, but that, is that really benefiting anybody? Or this is really, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but so I think really some of us think that this is a way to guarantee our jobs. Because I have to talk to you. You're, you're right. Mm -hmm. you know, we, you know, I mean, you know, that, that's often, what I was going to ask you too, myself. I mean, do you find when you do statistical sampling, do you find you have like an excess of personnel within that facility? Because you're doing as much less. Yes. yes. That was the number one concern, unspoken by all our staff. What the heck are these guys trying to do? They must be doing another workforce reduction exercise here. Yeah. Right? So we said, look, we promise you that this is not going to happen. And watch our words. So far, we have not missed a single person in any one of these accounts for this week. Quite the opposite. Yeah, do we, yeah, have y'all thought about just building up a sustained training team to go around? Because especially with turnover and the new equipment that comes around, so that way the biomed don't have to be the one going around always doing the training. We don't have a luxury to really do that, to have a dedicated team to do that. Maybe, you know, in the service you can have that. What we have to, unfortunately, use the same people. But the reality is, I don't know about you guys, but our clients keep buying more and more equipment. But they never ever tell us that, oh, just hire a few more bombers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one more, one more. Yeah. So I, I, can, I can ask anybody, I, I can show you graphs. Over a 10 year period, the bombman number has basically stayed flat, and the number of pieces of equipment has just kept climbing. So, Bottom line is that we have more work than we can ever deal with. So why are we firing people? Why not firing people? Right? Yes. Question I have here. Uh, you have a lot of statistics up here uh, and a lot of data. Now, to me, this looks like there's a software program that you have either that be either Microsoft Excel or something that you have built a template for to start collecting this data. Is that something that is available to us, or do we have to go back and reinvent the wheel here as far as gathering this, this statistical data? You would really give us a whole lot more credit than we can do. <laughs> we, all this has been done totally manually. Manually meaning we use Excel, yes, but manually. The data is inside, you have a CMS or something, right? So we put error codes in there, and the error codes are assigned by the text into work orders, and we go to the central CMS database, which is a Microsoft SQL database, nothing special. We download that information, dump it into an Excel file, one per hospital, and then try to group there and collect into another set for each equipment type, and then all this has been done manually. Not because we don't have the resources to do it, but we were in virtual ter territory. We don't know why this is going to come out of this. Sure, sure. So we need to first play with things until we feel comfortable before we can really program anything. We are still not programming, we are still not comfortable that we have found all of this, and we are still tweaking, analyzing, etc. As I said before, now we are ready to go to the next phase. The next phase is that we are going to reduce the number of things that we are going to analyze, although these failure codes continue to be applied to every single piece of equipment in those hospitals. But we are going to now narrow our rate. We did a intentional exercise of 22 equipment groups spanning a significant range of severities because we wanted to test the, the ideas. Now, we know that the fruit that we can now really uh, grab it and use is not focusing on high end, on the few, if you know, I mean, the few CT scanners or ultrasound units, or the low end, the 
the Sphigo minorities or something like that. Moderate. So let's take the middle group that the defending commander sometimes sits on the top of the inclusion or sometimes sit on the bottom of the inclusion, so it's included or excluded, and sometimes they typically have very large numbers, so we're talking about policy facilities, thermometers, patient scales, and things that goes a little bit higher, uh, 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 vital science monitors, etc., etc. Things that you have typically 50 or 100 units in each hospital, that if you can change your strategy there, you can save quite a bit of resources, right? Because if you have five, you, you decrease your frequency by half, you are not going to gain much. Right? So we are going to focus on those, and we are going to also clean up the random model issue, so we have more solid comparisons, and also we are going to address, uh, once for all, this OEM recommendation thing. So we are going to have something exact as OEM said, and then we are going to publish this, show it to transmission, show it to CMS, show it to DNV, say, hey, no common bug as it anymore. You got that here to show that OEM recommendation of what we do is exactly the same result. But if you don't believe it, you go in and test yourself. So we want to focus on a few specific groups, probably, let's say, 20, 25 groups, instead of the whole horizon of medical groups, because it's too many for us to handle. And there is no real yield return on investment. Okay. Have you actually went to the Joint Commission during an evaluation and they, and they bought off on us or, or DNV? Okay. Like um, I have to think about how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've shared uh, the publications with the Joint Commission. We have shared the publication with DNV. And, uh, and through some indirect means, we have shared some of this information with the CMS. We have not received any direct feedback from none of those three except for DNV. DNV said that we like what you guys are doing, and uh, we obviously cannot uh, uh, test your ideas because they don't directly oversee, and we are not going to recommend formally what you do, but uh, we do appreciate that uh, this is something that uh, is helpful, the, the right direction is helpful for them to understand things. And if they come across somebody doing something like this, it will give them a good indication that these people are, are trying to really make the right measurements. By the way, DMV claims that they have received the same authorization as the Joint Commission received last year to flexibly, flex, to make it flexible the uh, requirements, because previously they were using exactly the CMS verbiage, and, uh, but they are willing to, to do that. Uh, so, but I have not seen that officially published yet. Okay. I'll let you know what they say, because my survey will be in like two months. <laughs> yeah. My DMV. Good. Yes. Who assumes the liability? What you're what I see is you're increasing your liability exposure. Absolutely. Who pays for it? Who's, who assumes it? We're a third party company. We pay enough money on liability insurance. We can't. This is excellent stuff that you presented. It's great. It's great food for thought. Mm -hmm. But in my reality, mm -hmm. we have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations because the liability exposure is huge. I have an example here of a piece of equipment that came for our office. Mm -hmm. It's on a Medfusion 3500 series it's from a large hospital group in Texas. There's a label on it that says it was initially inspected. No more preventive maintenance is done, is due. Mm -hmm. You read the manual, in the manual it says mandatory annual testing. Mm -hmm. So taking care of the regulatory agencies, that's one thing. I'm worried about the lawyers. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, you are right. Uh, at the end of the day, everyone is liable. However, uh, you guys promised that you never heard this from me. Uh, the legal system in the United States is all about money. Exactly. So, at the end of the day, who is sued is who has the deepest pockets. 
So, let's be clear. Rami is not ever going to sue. You guys know that. <laughs> <laughs> Even the nurses are not going to sue. No, but if I own the company that employs. Yes, you're going to be sued. I'm going to be sued. <laughs> the husband is going to be sued. The doctor is going to be sued. Everybody's going to be sued. Okay? Now, the legal doctrine says that the plaintiff's lawyer has to prove that you did something wrong or you were negligent in what you should do. And the argument will be you did not do as the You were negligent yes. because you did not follow the solution. Mandatory. Yes. So you have to have data to prove it. That what you did did not cause the problem. Now, first, I'm like you. I work for a company, Arma, has a, has a big name and big deep pockets, and therefore it's always sued. And I am the privileged uh, sacrificial man that takes care of all the special incidents, all the lawsuits. I can show you my leg here, kicked many times by my lawyer, who said, shut up, shut up, don't talk, because I'm the one as the official designated deposing witness. Uh, and previous to that, I worked for another company that some of you may have heard, called Atlantic PRN, uh, Life Support Services. Therefore, Life Support Services is what they provide, namely ventilators and fusion pumps. And guess what? Uh, okay. uh, during the 12 years there, I never lost any lawsuits. Uh, at our mark, uh, I personally was never involved in a lawsuit that we lost. That does not mean that we did not pay or that Medicare we did not sell, because at the end of the day, it's all about money. Okay. Uh, so you definitely need to be comfortable being talking with your lawyers and your uh, uh, insurance company uh, that what you're doing is the right thing, is defensive in court. And this is exactly the kind of that we are going to show in court if you guys will. There is the data. Okay? And this data is scientific data. This is not make believe data. Okay. Now, if you don't have similar data, you will be in a very difficult position to prove that what I did it's not wrong. Okay. Now, they still have to prove that the equipment actually was the cause of the problem, and not the user or not the something else that happened. Okay. And it is for this reason that manufacturers pretty much every single one of them that I can think of have built in memories to record so-called filler codes or error codes or whatever. That's exactly the same attitude because they say, hey, the thing alarm, you know them. The thing said, don't use me, and you went ahead and used it. The thing said, you punched 100 instead of 10.0. But that's what's missing, so it's not my fault. Everybody is doing that. Okay. So, yes, liability is a very big issue, but I think has been exaggerated because I have yet to see a real significant case of failure to maintain equipment that is really became a significant loss so that somebody had to pay a lot of money. That does not mean that it does not happen. The last time the FDA thought about regulating so-called services of medical devices, including us, therefore, was what? Last thing you may remember, this was almost 10 years ago now, mm -hmm. okay? The FDA published on the Federal Register a proposal to regulate remarketers, services, and reprocessors. Had lots and lots of meetings, reviewed lots and lots of data, and one of the groups that you folks probably heard of, it's called Equity Institute, was there. They analyzed thousands and thousands of MedWatch reports, the so-called ball database, and could not come up with a handful of patient incidents, death, etc. reported that day that was caused by maintenance. There was everything else, but none really to maintenance. Manufacturers cried foul, manufacturers jumped up and down, did lots and lots of things at the end of the day, and I remain to record. There's no case here. The back off. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that 
if you got your company, your staff do something wrong and consciously do something wrong, it does not have the public justification, you will not be held liable. And you will. So you need to have a good case in your hand. But don't think this is the only reason that we should be practicing defensive maintenance, like defensive med medicine. It's the same thing. Just because I need to defend myself and I overprotect myself and you know, basically waste uh, the money of the healthcare system. Our so society I'm, has forced us into that. I mean, you say defensive medicine, we have to address tort reform, things yes. like that. But, but our society has yes. forced us into that. But what have we done to counteract that? We have not provided that to counteract that. Has anyone provided that to say, hey, I'm doing the right thing here? Because believing manufacturer recommendation is the right thing is really, at the end of the day, nothing but motherhood and apple pie, right? It's just a belief, because they, they don't need to provide any proof. They don't have any proof, right? So, now, let's be honest. There are good mothers and they're not so good mothers. There are good apple pies and some of them are so good apple pies too, right? So, I think it's incumbent on us, not just as a company, but as a professional, to really measure and prove what we're doing is the right thing. If we don't do that, we are the ones who are letting others push us into this corner and say, do buy the manufacturer recommendation because I don't have anything to prove. Yes, sir? Just a kind of a question mm -hmm. on your procedure and how you do this. Mm -hmm. one, of the th one of your slides that caught my eye was you had, you had separated a single channel IV pump Mm -hmm. Well, multi-channel IV pump. Yes. But the risk factor for the single was almost double at 50, the multi-channel at 29. Okay. It's, they're both the same one. I would think that the multi-use would have double. I just, how, how, do you, how do you address things like that? I mean, are you strictly going off of repairs and failures, or is there some common sense that, hey, guys, this is really the same item? Yeah, you could use the oh, second. It's still a failure. Yeah. Of, of but the, but the user may use it with. Yeah. Yeah. Let's clarify something here. You are talking about severity or you are talking about risk? Because uh, yeah, there was a different slide that showed 50%. Oh, no, let's, let's clarify here. Okay, yeah, severity. I was looking at the all. Oh, severity is 60 for single channel, multi channel is 70, slightly higher for multi channel. Okay. You have more likelihood of making creating a problem in terms of severity, right? Because you have you are infusion more drugs, more things at one time, and therefore the severity is higher. Now the probabilities are derived from that. And we did not make this up. So this probability is lower than this one. I don't know why, but it is it what it is. It is. Perhaps numbers. Could be numbers, could be better training, could be could be as simple as the fact that when you have multiple single channel pumps, they may actually not be exactly the same standardized models, brands and models from the same manufacturer, because they have a hodgepodge, whereas they use multi channel, it's all designed the exact same way. Right, and so the, if, you, if you went to the extent to break, to separate single multi channel. Yes. You might need to go to the extent of separating, like you say, manufacturers. Yes. Models. Yes. We're doing that. So we're, we're going to spend more money to analyze it than we're going to save? Well, oh, we are spending time of the staff that is not on site at a particular client at a particular hospital. We are spending people in our shuttle office, basically my assistant and I, Looking at a computer, crunching down. So, right. So in your right. case, in your case, you're you're offsite. Yes. Doing this, but yeah. but for a hospital, you know that they're going to assign biomed Russ to do the two facilities. Hey, guess what? We're going to add something to your plate, and now he has to do this. I, 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 that's why I'm not saying that individual hospitals, individual 
uh, technicians should be doing this. That's why this is something that, like Justin referred, is something that maybe should be thought about as a system or a society or a group that makes sense. And that's why, as I, as the last thing of said, I'm not telling everybody to do this. I'm saying, and also we are not telling even within armor for everybody to do the same thing because, as I said before, we spend a lot of time to convince ourselves that when we have different brands and models, different things, we are seeing that these patterns repeat itself. So at the end of the day, we can use this same set of data to analyze between a hospital that did the coding versus a hospital that did not do the coding. Because they are not that different. There are definitely variations, standard deviations, etc., etc. But when you compare data that we obtain from different hospitals, they're not that radically different. So you can definitely, let me go all the way back here, you can definitely learn things from one group, small group, and apply to a bigger group. The same principle, as I said, applies to evidence based medicine. When they test drugs, they test drugs in a small control group. They don't test drugs on one million people. They test drugs on a few hundred people. And then they apply to millions of people. Of course, you may be the unlucky fellow that is an outlier of that one million that does not follow the few hundred they tested. Those things do happen. Right? But in this case, since machines are made by this, a limited amount of manufacturers and used by a limited number of people. If the same machine is used in New Zealand or Australia, I cannot guarantee you anything because I don't know how they use things there. But here in the United States, our nursing curriculum, our medical curriculum are fairly standardized. And our practices are very similar from state to state. So it's not too surprising to see, yes, there are variations, but they are not horrendous variations that the total loss side, one group is here and the other group is totally here. We don't see that. Yes, sir? Um, I, I think one of my takeaways of this discussion is the basic premise is let's find out what we should do and do that and then our gain will be we'll re, we will reduce our expense because we'll be focusing on doing the right thing instead of just doing it because we've always done it, you know, the real speed cutting off the ends. Okay, so if that's if that's one of the basic premises, mm -hmm. what's the business case? Do you have a model that you offer us that says, here's how you turn doing the right thing, and here's the business case that you're going to save X amount of dollars, or you're going to reduce your expense by a certain percentage? And is it only a financial business case, or is it also a model that says, we're going to do the right thing, and patient outcomes are going to be improved? Have you tried to tie doing the right thing to an outcome that is defensible or motivating? Uh, the, you are absolutely correct. Let's first talk about the financial side. Yes. If we were to follow the OEM recommendation, if we can calculate a piece of paper fairly easily. Equipment, this, a manufacturer said this, we can calculate how many hours we are going to spend per year. If you add all this up, this is the labor pool you would need. And if we do with a smarter process, not working harder, we can reduce the labor necessary, we can save a significant amount of money. On top of that, by resolving these use error problems, these accessory or barrier problems, we can reduce the amount of equipment that you need. Because right now, a lot of nurses one more infusion pumps, one more monitors, one more this, more that, because a lot of them are always broken. The very mini problem, the uptime problem that you have as well. Right? So you end up buying more equipment than it's truly needed. That's another big savings, money. Okay? But on top of this, more equipment available means better, faster care for the patients. Right? I don't have a quantification of that because it is a whole lot more difficult to quantify that because sometimes we have in the industry the problem of not matching the demand 
with the amount of kumo we buy. We are not as efficient as a Southwest airline that fills every aircraft and, and use the fuel, the maintenance, all the kumo, very, very efficient. We don't. We tend to overbuy things and then we say, okay, we'll, the patient will come just because we can attract good physicians. So, so my right. my little point then is, mm -hmm. the prosecuting attorney is going to say, oh, okay, so you're out to save money, <laughs> yes, uh, and my client suffered because you shortchanged this this process, and yeah, it, it becomes a very difficult position to be in sometimes. That that is at first glance absolutely correct. However, if we can show that by doing the manufacturer way and doing our way has no difference, then why are you accusing us of being cutting corners here? I did not cause the failure because remember, there is unpreventable failures here. So, so that's the business case right. that I'd like to see a model that helped me say, well, our outcomes are equal to or better than because of this process. This it's exactly. not all about saving money. Yeah, we yes. reduced our staff, or yes. we did whatever, but, but we truly did not harm any patients. That's, yeah, that's exactly what we're going after. Okay. Now, ideally, what I would really like to do, which we don't have the means to do, is to measure, like what he was saying, measure the uptime of equipment, the availability of equipment, user satisfaction for the equipment. If we could measure all those things in all places, in a consistent manner, then we can enhance the answer to your question. But we really don't have that level of control, level of feedback that we would like to get. Have you used the, the statistical sampling and stuff on life-saving equipment like ventilators, or strictly infusion pumps and, and SPO2s, stuff like that? We do not do the true PMs in any way different but the, those recommended by the manufacturers. So if there is a replacement of parts that is, mm -hmm. done, that is recommended, so ventilators, you have valves, you have uh, regulators, you have uh, rubber parts, those we always perform exactly equivalent to manufacturing. Because those things are too risky for us to play around with. Right. Now, when it's non-critical piece of equipment, we may decide to lengthen the period of time for replacement, etc. But we don't really uh, uh, do much there for one simple reason. The number of true PMs is very, very small. The amount of money you save by not buying a PM kit is very, very small. Right. So what's the game here? Really? Now, the labor spent on doing unnecessary schedule maintenance is very high. And I'd much rather dedicate that time to help the users because we know how much they are suffering for not having the equipment. Right. I'm not saying anything uh, so strange to you folks uh, that nurses hide equipment in drawers, closets. I have seen equipment hidden in the ceiling tiles uh, because they are so scared of running out of equipment because they say, I cannot find things. I haven't looked there yet. <laughs> you should. Yeah. I'll take care of those tomorrow. <laughs> but I see your point. I could see doing the statistical sampling on, on SPO2s and infusion pumps. Uh, I'd never heard of any incident involving those that was not user error. You know, that equipment malfunctioned that caused any harm. Uh, I haven't had that experience. But, but again, we don't know how we do it. Right? So if you so, don't ever go and check whether the patient scale has gone out of calibration, you really don't know. Right. So you should check a few and see what's happening. Yeah, right? I can see that. Uh, most of my problems are user errors. Oh, no question you about know, that. No problem found when, when yeah. we get there, which is obviously a user error. They didn't know what they were yeah, doing. But, but so in your experience, beating up on the user solving anything? Well, this, but this, it's kind of relieving, you know. Take that too before we do it. Yes, that's right.
Uh, just a thought occurs to me. I, I used to be in the Army. And um, maybe either by accident or, or by design, uh, there's more compliance with uh, the recommendations that either the manufacturer or the military sets forth for operators to check their equipment at a shift basis or daily basis. And, and my experience was that people adopted those sort of. I was in the reserves, so most of those people that I worked with were in the reserves as well. In, in their daytime jobs, their Monday through Friday jobs, they, they probably did never really checked equipment other than maybe the defibrillators on the crash carts. But what I saw is that once they started checking their equipment um, on a regular basis, they knew how to use it. They reported problems that otherwise I wouldn't see for another six months or five months when the next preventative maintenance cycle would, would you know, present itself, if you want to call it that. Um, <clears throat> now, what you're suggesting I, I entirely agree with is, is rounding, and that's one of the things, uh, and finding out what the user is experiencing, even if it's a complaint about how the equipment operates right now. It's, Sometimes something we take back to the manufacturer or something that we talk about a different clinical practice, but it prevents those those use errors from popping their uh, ugly heads up at the wrong time when we've got joint yeah, commission. You said that there. our current operation now within our SOPs, our guys, as they come in and change shifts, they actually go to all the wards as they enter the shift and say, anybody having any issues or concerns with anything on this within this area? Mm -hmm. So they're touching those operators and re and that's why I come up with sustainment training because especially for us, sustainment training is huge. Mm -hmm. So we'll go out there and they have to program that into their daily schedule throughout the week. When do you want some sustainment training on XYZ particular pieces of equipment? And our downtime has changed drastically just within the last three years that we've implemented it. And I have 122 units under us all medical. So like I said, it's, it's changing for us. We call it G4. That's our biggest spender was supplies and parts. Now that a lot of that stuff is going down. It's Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The reality, unfortunately, in the civilian side is that we rarely see that many training efforts going on, unfortunately. And more and more, we see shorter and shorter uh, workforce in the clinical side as well. Oh, and, uh, more, more I actually learned this from a civilian guy, because every place I went, I worked part-time at the hospitals. And I actually picked that up from one of my civilian managers that I worked mm -hmm. for in Georgia. Now that once I came in this position with some people to back me up, we were able to implement it. Yeah. Well, ideally, that's exactly what we should be doing, but on the other hand, we have to work within our realities as well, right? It's getting late. Uh, are there questions, comments? Well, appreciate your time.
He's going to talk about uh, IMS's involvement in this meeting. IMS uh, was generous enough to uh, donate the food, but Joe's got a few things from the IMS rep that he's going to just help us. Oh, she just wanted me to tell you all. She called me. I know our, we do a lot of business with IMS. for are repairing our flexible endoscopes and our rigid scopes. Um, they do a pretty good job. Um, I've been to the facility down in Florida, and it's a high-class uh, facility. Uh, she just wanted to yeah. me to let you know that you know she's nice and she's helpful. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, she's got some pamphlets outside and, and for you guys to take, and uh, they, they do a very good uh, job on my Pentax scopes. They don't do Fuji for some reason, uh, some contractual sort of arrangement. With they do Fuji, but not west of the Mississippi or something. Some, some contractual arrangement, but uh, they do great on my Pentax scopes. And, and, I don't know, that's about it. And that's all. If anybody has anything they want to bring up for the good and welfare of the meeting or the society, nope. Actually, uh, oh. I, I met with uh, a vendor, um, Access Medical. Um, they do ultrasounds um, out of uh, Chicago, I think. Indianapolis. St. Louis. Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I met with them recently, and yes, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> um, and they were uh, they, they're telling me that they can actually bring somebody out here to train. You know, I'm, I'm especially uh, interested in the Phillips Center training, but you know, I don't have enough students for them to send somebody out for me because it's me and Russ for two hospitals. It's just me and Russ, that's not enough students. So if anyone else is interested in, in learning, we're just taking advantage of that stuff. They've actually contacted us and wanted to do one of our presentations sometime. We're right. looking well, at them possibly next year. And they, they became a sponsor. They wanted to be a sponsor. The Access Ultrasound is a sponsor. That's not why we're bringing this up. And I will yeah. tell you, I haven't touched base with Joe since this conversation went on earlier this week. But there is a possibility that if we get enough people within our society, not just at one organization or within one healthcare organization, that we may all benefit from a discount. Normally the discount is extended to one organization and so on and so on. So uh, I approach them about that type of opportunity, hearing that they may provide some on-site, or is it called regional training? Regional, right. um, that's, the, that's the value of having an organization, or at least that's one value of having an organization, is that yes, if your institution or organization can only send one person, and sending a person to technical training is oftentimes very expensive just from the travel perspective. And think about this next time you're thinking about training is whether or not you should approach Joe or me or somebody through the ISIS website right, and say, can we get a few more people in the room and that company will come out. Um, there are also some discussions that I've had with GE on that very topic for healthcare IT related topics um, and those are just you know the tip of the iceberg I'm sure you guys all have some certain needs uh, it's a, it's, it gives us the ability to work together and also provide some level of training and, and last but not least probably on this at least for me is that we will be um, sending out a little survey to folks to see who wants to uh, form a CVET study group. We've had a few people approach us um, about that, about forming a group, and if that solidifies, I've already talked to uh, the Colorado Association of Biomeds. Uh, we, again, as a society, can do some things with them that will be cheaper per person than if you did it as an individual. Plus, if you have enough, also if you have enough personnel, and that's, you can coordinate that, that study group. If you want to do it over a certain number of days, you can coordinate and you can have a test, you can have a test site locally as well on a Saturday or fall and that in the past. We, we, we have done, uh, I convinced them to do that once and nobody decided to test then, but I think there's a resurgence of interest in the CBET. Now, ISIS is not a CBET organization in the past. Some people have thought of it as the guys like me who are CBET are only doing this because we get our points. I don't need points from this. I do too many other things, as some of you know, that give me some sort of point value. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we do do biomed things. 
and that's the message. If it's a, if we have interest in a CBAT study group, we'll help you guys kind of get together wherever you are located, and so that you can have that that group. And the next step may be that we help some way negotiate better funding or fund it somehow. Anything else? Okay. Meeting adjourned. Oh.